Hello. I'm Hunter, and welcome back to Unexpected History. A generally unimportant Irish immigrant, so like hundreds of thousands of others common at the time, was murdered in New York City in the midst of the Great Depression. The murderers, and there were several involved in the plot, tried to make it look like an accident, but the man remained, shall we say, unintentionally uncooperative. This is the story of Mike Malloy, aka Iron Mike, and it's a wild one. Join me as we look at this little piece of unexpected history. But first, please take a moment to sub to the channel. It really helps us with that pesky YouTube algorithm. Now, on to the video. In January of 1933, Mike Malloy was deep in a bottle of whiskey at his local speakeasy. This was nothing new for Malloy, as he had long since taken to the bottle after losing his job as a stationary engineer during the height of the Great Depression. The Irishman had lost everything when jobs in heavy industry disappeared. Despite being destitute, a so-called speakeasy derelict, Malloy was known as a pretty easy-going guy, and almost as quick with a smile as he was at emptying whatever bottle of alcohol he could scrounge up the money to buy. As the US was in the final year of that abomination now known as Prohibition, his choices were admittedly few. And therein lay the foundation for the murder plot against him. This night however, was very different than most others Malloy spent drinking. Instead of needing to be frugal with what little money he had available, or having to beg, wheedle, or cajole other patrons into buying for him, this night he was drinking on the house, and at the personal invitation of the speakeasy's owner, one Tony Marino. We can only imagine Malloy's wonderment at this baffling and unexpected turn of events. Perhaps the proverbial Irish luck was returning to him in some small way after all. There was no possible way Malloy, poor and homeless, could have suspected that Marino, as well as the group of four other people enjoying drinks with him, had an ulterior motive for this sudden largesse. To his besotted mind, nothing mattered but that the whiskey was flowing freely for him, perhaps for the first time in his life, but it was certainly the first time in recent memory. Unfortunately for the conspirators, and much to their eventual chagrin, Mike Malloy was near unkillable. The general conspiracy goes back to December 1932. Marino, together with Red Murphy, the speakeasy's bartender, the local undertaker Frank Pasqua, a fruit seller named Daniel Kreisberg, and a cabbie, Hershey Green, a group later known as the Murder Trust, were discussing ways to satiate their greed. Ideas were thrown around. Did anyone know of a job going down somewhere, or an ironclad way to scam a few dollars from someone? Since the stock market crash, talk like this had most assuredly occurred countless times all around the world but not much ever really went beyond the conversation phase. Someone jokingly suggested getting a life insurance policy on a non-existent terminally ill relative, and voila, an idea was born. They could insure someone who seemed likely to die, and soon. Someone whose death would be unquestioned, someone not likely to be missed by anyone, then wait for that death to happen, and maybe even hasten it along. Once the murder trust cemented the idea in their minds, all they needed was a victim. Then they thought of the perfect person to play the role, in the form of a certain perpetually drunken Irishman. He had no family, at least not in the area, and no one seemed to be his actual friend. Seriously, who was going to miss him? A few days later, Red Murphy took out three life insurance policies worth a total of $1,788, worth nearly $32,000 today, on a Nicholas Mellory, posing as the fictional Mellory's equally fictional brother, Joseph. As beneficiary, Joseph stood to receive double the payout if the death was accidental. $64,000 would have been quite the sum during the depths of the Great Depression. The double indemnity was inspired by a notorious New York murder that occurred five years previous, in 1927. Ruth Brown Snyder, together with her married lover, Henry Judd Gray, murdered her husband Albert, after persuading him to buy a life insurance policy worth $48,000 which would pay extra in the event Albert's death was a violent one. Ruth and Henry garroted Albert on March 20, and stuffed his nose with chloroform-soaked rags, attempting to make it seem like he was killed during a burglary. They were quickly caught, tried, and convicted, with their executions by electric chair taking place in 1928, within 10 minutes of each other. The story was the inspiration for the classic novella, Double Indemnity, and the noir film of the same name, released in 1936 and 1944, respectively. Killing Nicholas Mellory, name Mike Malloy, was supposed to be the easiest part of the plan. After all, Malloy was a known drunkard, and at the time, New York averaged nearly 800 deaths per year from alcohol poisoning. 
People wouldn't raise an eyebrow to one more. Malloy would be just another unfortunate, who died to the drink. The murder trust figured the easiest way to kill off their mark would be to allow him to drink himself to death. After all, by all accounts, the man appeared to be almost there already. And so, Marino actively encouraged Malloy to drink as much as he could put down. What they didn't reckon on was Malloy's seeming imperviousness to alcohol. That's not to say Malloy could drink forever, never feeling the effects, but he could apparently drink prodigious, almost Herculean, amounts before that happened. What started out as almost a joke to the murder trust, as they assumed giving Malloy as much free booze as he could consume would lead swiftly to his demise, soon led to bemusement, then confusion, followed by consternation and frustrated amazement, as Malloy kept coming back for more every night. Whether he simply had a much higher tolerance for alcohol, had a hardier constitution, or just had a more profound desire to remain amongst the living than most people, may never be known, but the murder trust, and particularly Tony Marino, was running out of patience. No matter how much Malloy drank, still he kept living. Until this point, they'd been serving good quality booze to Malloy, and no amount seemed to put him down. It was time to start playing dirty. Since ridiculous amounts of good alcohol seemed ineffective, perhaps it was time to start using things not suitable for human consumption. Out came the methanol, commonly known as wood alcohol at the time. It smells like regular alcohol, which meant it was unlikely to be noticed when mixed in a regular drink, especially by someone like Malloy, who was almost always inebriated. When mixing it failed, much to the gang's dismay, they started serving him straight methanol, yet to the amazement of the conspirators, Malloy returned to the speakeasy, time and time again. Denatured alcohol, specially made to be poisonous and thoroughly undrinkable, was next, but the man inexplicably refused to die seemingly relying upon stereotypical Irish stubbornness. The murder trust was at a loss to understand how Malloy was still breathing, let alone walking around, healthy and hale. If alcohol, of any stripe, kept failing to kill the Irishman, perhaps food would do the trick. One of the gang found a positively ancient can of sardines. The fish were rotten to the core. Surely they would finish Malloy. They made a sandwich of the foul-smelling fish, offering it to their target, but just for good measure, they threw in some special condiments. Broken glass, carpet tacks, even the sardine tin were chopped to pieces, ground up, and added to the meal. Malloy was seemingly unaffected, simply asking for seconds. Next, Red Murphy found a jar of oysters behind the bar, which had been marinating in denatured alcohol for some reason. As Murphy had once been a chemist, he knew the combination of oysters and alcohol could lead to serious, even fatal, food poisoning. Now this, this might be perfect for the gang's purposes. They served it up to Malloy, accompanied with some more of the bad liquor to wash them down. To their complete and utter disbelief, it had no discernible effect on the man. A few days after the oysters, they decided to get nature to do the job at which they kept failing. One particularly frigid January night, after Malloy was well and truly drunk, they took him to Cretona Park, near the Bronx Zoo. After Malloy passed out on a park bench, the murder trust opened up his coat and shirt, and thoroughly soaked the man with cold water. Surely Malloy would freeze to death on this night. Even someone in the best of health would have difficulty getting through the night alive if they were drunk, covered in ice, and not clothed properly. Malloy didn't have a snowball's chance in hell in their minds. To their absolute astonishment, Malloy was back at the speakeasy the next morning. What was it going to take to kill this man? Frank Pasqua, one of the five conspirators, was left with a bad cold as a result of the exertion necessary to get the drunken man to the park. It was a rare moment of karma, which had seemingly been ignoring this saga until that point. Growing impatient, and with Marino's stock of alcohol diminishing greatly, and costs skyrocketing, the gang decided they needed to take a somewhat more direct approach. This is where Hershey Green takes a more active role in the conspiracy. The son of Russian immigrants ran a taxi company throughout the Bronx. He was asked to arrange for Malloy to, accidentally, have a collision with a vehicle. At the end of January, lying on the side of the road near Baychester Avenue and Gunhill Road, Malloy was found battered, bruised, and suffering from a concussion, a possible fractured skull, and a broken shoulder, but with no memory of how it happened. He was rushed to Fordham Hospital for treatment. His survival was unknown to the gang as they poured through newspapers, searching for news of a man fatally struck by a vehicle in the area. They were looking in vain, as it turned out, when Malloy walked through the door about three weeks later, clamoring for a drink. During Malloy's convalescence, 
Another man was found on February 7, also battered and bloodied, at Austin Place in the South Bronx. He was carrying the fictional Nicholas Mellory's ID card, along with some documentation listing his next of kin, one Frank Pasqua. It seemed that the murder trust was so weary of dealing with the man who wouldn't die, Mike Malloy, that they chose another destitute Irishman to play Nicholas Mellory. They failed to kill this man as well. In fact, this man, later identified as 31-year-old unemployed plasterer Joseph Patrick Murray, remembered at least one of the men responsible, a face he apparently knew quite well, Hershey Green. While Murray was recuperating in Lincoln Hospital, the gang resolved to finish off Malloy, once and for all, and this time, there was no attempt at subtlety. Malloy was going to die. On the 22nd of February, Murphy and Kreisberg, the fruit seller, rented a room about a half mile from the speakeasy. Once again being given the royal treatment by Marino's establishment, Malloy drank himself into near unconsciousness. Seizing the opportunity, Murphy and Kreisberg brought Malloy to the room. Throwing the drunken man down on the bed, they unhooked one end of the tube from the room's gaslight, stuffed it in Malloy's mouth, and turned on the gas. Malloy would not awaken this time. He died about 20 minutes later. All told, they tried a startling nine times to kill Iron Mike, as he later became known, only succeeding on the 10th. In addition to the attempts detailed thus far, they had tried mixing his drinks with antifreeze, tried caving his skull in during a beating, and even tried shooting him with an automatic weapon, at that point foregoing any ideas of making it look accidental. When all was said and done, with all the free booze and food, all the planning, the renting of the room, among other things, the murder trust spent almost $1,900, according to one estimate, attempting to cash in on the three policies totaling $3,600. Not exactly the best return on investment ever. The following morning, for a $100 fee, a Dr. Frank Manzella arrived at the room to sign the death certificate, listing lobar pneumonia as the cause of death, with acute bronchitis as a secondary cause. With the false death certificate in hand, Red Murphy received the $800 payout for one of the policies. As a further insult to Malloy, Frank Pasqua made a show of writing a $400 check to impress the insurance agents, promising he would spare no expense for the fictional Nicholas Mellory's funeral. In truth, Malloy was buried in a coffin worth $10, and in a grave that cost just 12 more. Malloy wasn't even embalmed, just to cut the cost of the burial as much as possible. This decision would prove to be instrumental in the murder trust's downfall, and most fortuitous to law enforcement when the plot finally came to light. On March 18, a local gangster known as Tough Tony Boston was shot and killed. He was well known at the speakeasy, and Red Murphy was taken into custody as a material witness. This meant that when it came time for the other two policies to be paid out, the agents were unable to locate the fictional Joseph Mellory. This greatly raised their suspicions. Meanwhile, police had heard through the local rumor mill of the unbelievable story of Iron Mike, and reported the seemingly tall tale to the district attorney, Samuel Foley, who ordered Malloy exhumed for a proper autopsy. The forensic sciences of toxicology and pathology were just starting to hit their stride in the 1930s. Consequently, when the autopsy of Malloy was performed, it found the now classic cherry-red discoloration of carbon monoxide poisoning all over his body. The irony of being too frugal with the burial is that, had Pasqua had Malloy embalmed, no sign of the carbon monoxide would have been found. The day after the true cause of death was found to be asphyxiation by carbon monoxide, Marino, Pasqua, Green, Kreisberg, and Murphy were arrested on a charge of first-degree murder, although Green and Kreisberg were already in custody on separate, unrelated charges. Dr. Frank Manzella was also arrested and charged with accessory after the fact. Joseph Maglioni, the suspect in the murder of tough Tony Boston, worked out a deal with the prosecution. He would get a reduced charge of manslaughter in exchange for his testimony against the murder trust. In May, D.A. Samuel Foley announced an alarming twist to the story. They were now investigating the death of Mabel Carlson, known locally as Betty, who had been found dead in the room of Tony Marino on St. Patrick's Day, 1932. Her cause of death was listed as bronchopneumonia, with acute and chronic alcoholism as a contributing factor. She had reportedly been exposed to the brutal cold via an open window and water poured over her during the night of her death. The similarities to the Cretona Park attempt on Malloy's life were eerie and unmistakable. 
The New York Times reported that Marino's explanation was that Carlson was a destitute regular at the speakeasy, and all he did was provide her a home. The DA said his office was looking into the possibility that Marino, along with an unknown woman, may have collected $2,000 in life insurance following Carlson's death. Foley also added that his office was working with life insurance companies to find other similar cases, as he had received letters from half a dozen families whose family members had lived in the Bronx, but had been missing for over two years. When the trial began in October 1933, in exchange for his turning state's witness, Hershey Green was allowed to plead guilty to the lesser charge of first-degree assault, admitting to hitting Joseph Patrick Murray with his taxi. Murphy, Marino, Pasqua, and Kreisberg tried everything they could imagine to beat the rap, even claiming that the witnesses testifying against them were also involved in the plot with them. With the exception of Marino, the conspirators even attempted to lay the blame at the feet of dead mobster, Tony Bostone, claiming he had intimidated them, at the proverbial gunpoint, to kill Malloy and bring him the insurance payouts. Murphy and Kreisberg each claimed the other was the one who turned on the gas that asphyxiated Malloy. Pasqua's attorney argued that Frank was just the undertaker, and had no active role in the planning. The DA dismissed this claim, pointedly referring to Pasqua's confession to the scheme two months after Boston was killed. Marino and his lawyer took a different tack, claiming insanity. His lawyer had a doctor testify that a childhood fall, and a recent illness, most likely syphilis, combined to make Marino become abnormal. The DA had a rebuttal witness, a neurologist who had come to the conclusion that Marino was faking his abnormal behavior. Based on the testimony of the prosecution's witnesses, and the autopsy findings, on October 19, the jury returned with the verdicts. All four were found guilty of first-degree murder. The defendants' reactions were recorded thusly. Marino glared angrily, Pasqua winced, Kreisberg swayed, while Murphy remained inscrutable. Later, D.A. Foley told the press that he did not, quote, want to give the impression of gloating over these convictions, but once more, a Bronx jury has upheld the local reputation for common sense and courage, unquote. He further added that he believed the verdicts were proper, quote, for this most cruel murder, which was inspired by nothing more than sordid greed, unquote. The four men were sentenced to death by electric chair at New York's Sing Sing prison. In a weird sense of irony, as if karma itself had a sense of humor, the murder trial's judge, James Barrett, had been the same judge to officiate Pasqua's wedding just a few years prior. Hershey Green got five to ten years for first-degree assault on Murray. On June 7, 1934, Marino, Pasqua, and Kreisberg were put to death in the electric chair. Marino was 28, Kreisberg 29, and Pasqua was just 24 at the time of his execution. Red Murphy's execution however, was put on hold a mere two hours before it was scheduled, by New York's Lieutenant Governor, Michael William Bray. Murphy was not who everyone thought he was. His lawyer had received information from another inmate that Murphy, under the name Archie Mott, had been committed to the Connecticut School for Boys, escaping in 1929. He was found to be mentally unbalanced by a doctor in 1933. It was the district attorney, Samuel Foley, the very man who got the conviction against Murphy, now pleading so strongly for the stay of execution, based on this new information. The reprieves would not last forever, as Murphy was denied a new trial. He was executed on the 5th of July. He was 28 years old. Samuel Foley went on to help secure a conviction against Richard Hauptman for the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby, far and away the most famous and high-profile criminal trial of the first half of the 20th century. Foley would go on to become a well-known and highly respected judge. Upon his death in 1951, an estimated 10,000 people lined streets in the Bronx for his funeral. No real information has ever been found about Michael Malloy. Some reports say he was 60 years old, others 40. His autopsy photo shows a man who appears to be in the early stages of middle age, not the later stages. All we really know for certain is that he was an immigrant from Ireland. Why he emigrated? who he had been before the Great Depression, and how, of all people, he wound up as the target for murder may forever remain mysteries to us. The tales of Iron Mike, Mike the Durable, Mike the Indestructible, first spoken in the coarse neighborhoods of the Bronx in 1933, became a national sensation during the trial of the Murder Trust, and from there, the stuff of legend. Michael Malloy, whomever he had been, was reburied after the autopsy in Hartsdale, New York, at Ferncliff Cemetery, in the same $10 coffin, in an unmarked grave. 
no one to claim him, and no one to mourn him. Thank you for watching what turned out to be our longest video thus far. I edited the script down as far as I thought possible and have it still be an engaging, informative story. If this proves to be as popular as I think it can be, I'll try to do longer form videos every once in a while. All things being equal though, I'm just glad you're along for the ride. Please give us a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel so you never miss a video. If you'd like to support what we do, the links to our Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, and Merchandise pages will be down in the description box. Again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.